interesting news release from Metals One this morning. Here to tell us about its implications, Jonathan Owen. Jonathan, what's it all about? Hi, Alistair. Good to be with you. What's it all about? Well, it's doubling our resource base and uh, paving the way for a material change in, a, in, the, in the pace of the company, really. It moves us squarely out of uh, an exploration into, into mining, uh, mine development. And that's very exciting for us. This is where we wanted to be. And it's also coming up to our 12 month anniversary since listing. So to achieve all this in such a short time, you know, it's, it's uh, a real testament to the, to the quality of the team and the ambition and the drive uh, to, get this, to get this done so quickly. I mean, in simple terms, we're talking, uh, in, in a sense anyway, about a doubling of the resource uh, at one level, aren't we? So tell us about the numbers. So as you might recall, we we uh, acquired 28.1 million tonne resource uh, at R1, uh, which is just down the road from P5. Today, we announced P5 resource numbers uh, for uh, slightly larger 29, 29 million tonnes. Similar, almost identical grades, uh, similar metal content, etc. Um, the importance of this for us, though, is that it's, it gives us a solid foundation now to move quite quickly into the preliminary economic assessment. So we undertook an internal conceptual economic and uh, technical assessment of the project earlier in the year. Uh, you know, we I've, I've been quite clear from the from the start. You know, we were targeted. We have been, and we'll continue to target 200 million ton resource over the longer term, over the next uh, over the next couple of years, as we go through the feasibility, pre-feasibility, etc. Uh, but my question to the consultants uh, that uh, did the conceptual work was: Do we need to identify a single discrete 200 million ton ore body to make this business work, or could we look at multiple, let's say, satellite ore bodies, either operating discreetly as independent mines, or maybe feeding? Or, or concentrate, or whatever it might be, into a central processing unit. Please look at all these uh, permutations and, and tell us, uh, you know, where we get best bang for the buck for our shareholders. What's what's the MPV, IR, etc. So they they did some um, uh, some napkin yeah. study, if you like, on that, and came back to us and said, no, you you this is a highly scalable opportunity you have here. It's uh, low cost mining, low cost uh, processing, high yield in terms of recoveries of the minerals, etc. Uh, you can lily pad this. You can leapfrog from one satellite operation to the next, to the next, to the next, or do them in parallel or stagger them, which, whichever way you like to uh, maximize your MPV. So what this does then, we have the first, let's say, potential mine at R1. We now have the second at uh, P5. And we've got a, a sausage machine of, of, of other targets coming through over the next uh, year or so to, to further add other operations onto that. But what it means is we can quite quickly now move into the preliminary economic assessment, uh, you know, an independently, um, uh, an independent assessment, more formal assessment of the, the business case here. And that's what we're going to do shortly. And the plan is to get that done this year. So to, um, to, to step back a bit and look at our sort of longer term ambition. We're aligning ourselves very much with the Critical Raw Materials Act, the, the EU's legislation that's driving domestic sourcing of these critical metals the nickel the copper the cobalt lithium manganese there's, there's a, quite a list of them uh, they want uh, a percentage of the industry's demand met from local sources sustainable local sources and that's what we're looking to to actually help contribute to so they set a benchmark of 2030 to achieve this um so what we've done is basically they've, they've done a um if you like a countdown schedule to 2030 of what we need to do when it's hugely ambitious to get a mine into production in that time scale it we're told by the environmental consultants we're told by the engineering consultants that it is achievable if we execute perfectly and i think we can we have to date we've delivered on time on drilling uh on uh on the mineral resource assessment etc so uh working that back and i'm going around the houses to get to this point is we need to do the preliminary economic assessment this year and move into the pre-fees next year and then very quickly into the full definitive feasibility study the year after uh, and in the meantime secure eu grants eu funding where we can and secure that uh the status of strategic project there is there is such a thing in the eu that then opens up uh the project fast tracking opportunities as well so the eu will come in and support the fast tracking of the permitting process for the mind for the environmental for social etc so ambitious busy time um but this 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 for us is you know the the um trying to find the metaphor but this really brings it brings it home that this is something that uh, is real and it's going to happen
So ambitious plans, lots going on on the ground and, and also in a context that's um, quite fast moving and interesting at a kind of macroeconomic level. Um, so tell us, first of all, about the um, preliminary economic assessment. Will there be any sort of news flow whilst that's underway, whilst that's happening? Um, will investors get any kind of updates along the way that they can look forward to? And um, do you think that there'll be um, uh, a sort of similar amount of news flow when you move into the pre-fees next year? I mean, it sounds like a, a sort of fairly am ag aggressive timetable. So certainly, yeah, it yeah. seems like you'll be achieving um, lots internally. How much are we going to get to hear about? No, absolutely. So with these times, these ambitious timescales, what I'm looking to do is to is to front load uh, the critical path items like the baseline environmental studies, et cetera, bring those uh, um, in really this year and get those kicked off this year because they're, they're the items that can often delay projects. So we're going to front load those projects. So you'll see a lot of news flow around uh, appointing environmental contractors, the the work that they do then is highly visual. So uh, I'm sure we have plenty of uh, pictures of people doing stuff in the fields, um, preliminary assessments on on various aspects of the of the operation, whether it's environmental, engineering, uh, um, and, and of course, you know, one of the benefits of having this business model, this multiple operations business model, is that uh, you know we continue to explore and develop and expand our resources over the next couple over the next uh, couple of years anyway. So there's there's still plenty of drilling to do, plenty of results and assays to share. Uh, more more models and resource estimates to publish. So there's no shortage of news flow. And how do you see the um, company um, positioned in the wider um, sort of macroeconomic environment? You did allude to it a moment ago um, when you mentioned the European Union and, and, and sort of various st strategic um, uh, accreditations that you could get. But I mean, in terms of the global nickel supply and demand situation, there's Indonesia to consider. Uh, you know, there's been um, a certain amount of interest in the price. Uh, you know, where's it going? And that's that's certainly a bit of an intangible or, a, uh, you know, a, a, a difficult conundrum to get to grips with. But what, what are your thoughts about how the company um, sits within that that sort of broader context? Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm very comfortable. It is. You're absolutely right. Uh, nickel. Well, many commodities at the moment are, are quite volatile, relatively volatile uh, compared to the long term uh, pricing. But you know, if you're if you're sitting at the lower end of the cost curve as uh, as we hope to be, and I'll explain why why we expect we will be, then um, you, you're kind of uh, protected from that volatility. One of the things that attracted us to this this project area when we acquired the assets off Blue Jay was uh, was the fact that we have an existing operation, or there isn't uh, an existing operation in the area, extracting, processing, successfully selling uh, minerals from the same the same type of ore as us. In fact, it's almost identical, similar grades. Um, and they've been doing that for a few years now. They're constrained uh, from expanding further. So people do ask, well, why don't they just expand further? Well, they, they have infrastructure constraints, uh, uh, regional zoning constraints, and so on. But they what they've demonstrated is, is two things, uh, two hugely important things. First is uh, economically, they can produce free cash flow throughout the commodity cycle. So when when nickel has been through its the lowest of its lows, they've still managed to generate thirty to thirty five percent EBIT uh, quarter on quarter. We've seen that recently again, and this is testament to the the fact that this this type of ore is amenable to bioheat bleaching. So which is a very cost effective way of extracting minerals. It's hugely efficient as well. You can ex they're extracting up to ninety seven percent of the nickel out of the ore through this method. That compares to a traditional, um, let's say, massive nickel sulfide deposit in Australia, where you might get recoveries of only seventy-five percent. They might be higher grade projects, but but they don't uh, they get the uh, the economies that we expect to achieve here. And the other major major important point, especially in consideration when we're all looking to support the green transition and the uh, digital transitions with the sustainable metals, is they have the lowest carbon footprint of any nickel producer globally. And again, we hope to uh, enjoy the same characteristic. So uh, to put that in perspective, they uh, produce nickel. I think it is about just over one tonne of CO2 per tonne of nickel. Uh, Indonesian nickel, you look at it almost, well, over 60 tonnes, 60 tonnes of carbon dioxide per tonne of nickel. Um, it might be economically cheap in terms of buying Indonesian nickel, but it comes with a huge price, not just in terms of carbon footprint, but also in terms of the environmental and social issues that we see in Indonesia with the these Chinese-funded uh, nickel miners 
yeah, devastating forests and communities and, and, and fishing grounds. Yeah, it certainly has a questionable reputation, Indonesia, in some respects. Um, but that, I mean, I guess that's a that's a conversation for another day. Um, tell me about the um, the the size of the the project you you are working on. It sounds like um, you know it's it sounds big, but where does it sort of sit in terms of um, you know global economic uh, or global global nickel projects is it is it sort of up there with the with the biggest is it a mid-tier project how do you see it I'd, I'd say we're junior to mid rapidly moving up to mid-tier so the 200 million ton uh target that we have longer term is is where we want to be that's 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 mid-tier verging on i would say verging on world class depends how you define what a world-class asset is is it on volume uh is it on uh, volume of contained metals is it on uh, ability to generate free cash flow throughout the commodity cycle and it certainly takes the that it, it will generate free cash flow uh rain or shine and then it's a question of volume um so that's that's really the opportunity here is to can you continue to build the up the, the volumes while having the business case defined and uh you know put under the nose at some point of, of project financiers in the short yeah. term i mean uh, you you were talking about your near, near neighbor a, a moment ago as well and i suppose it's worth sort of uh, slightly broadening out that point to to say that um, you're in an area or a jurisdiction that that's familiar with mining. So you know if you do get a world class or a project that it is close to world class, um, mm -hmm. there are going to be people around both in terms of local communities, government, bureaucrats who kind of know what to do with a project like that and how to help you um, make it work and also how to hold you to account in the ways that uh, any any company anywhere in the world ought to be held to account so it's not like you're you're sort of entering into an unknown mining area and, and trying to educate every man and his dog no it's, it's exactly absolutely right and uh you know that's a that's a risk for for a lot of projects particularly in, in northern scandinavia where you're into uh swami reindeer herding territory the Tura 2000 reserves, nature reserves, etc. We don't we don't have any of that. We're quite far south in that respect. We're south eastern Finland, and it is an historic mining uh, region. Uh, there are old and and existing and and new mines being built in, in the whole region. So that means you're absolutely right. We've got the workforce, potential workforce. We've got the service providers as well, which are hugely important to the success of a project uh, in the area. And then we have the communities themselves, and we have a a very good relationship with uh, with the communities with the municipalities around us and uh, they are hugely welcoming and these are regions uh, rural areas that have that are sort of suffering from an outpouring of uh, of gdp of income of, of people as they you know as, as they move to the the urban centers uh because there's not enough employment opportunities there so they're very welcoming to you know major industries like mining to to logging paper mills etc to help stem that tide and in fact uh, you know, draw people back to these regions so again um you know the social license to operate is is probably paramount it's it's, it's almost up there with the quality of the ore body that you're you're sitting on you need that license to operate and uh, we we don't we don't we currently don't see any impediments to to maintaining that and of course environmental my reference environmental studies kicking off shortly that includes the social impact assessments as well which so we'll be working closely with the communities to to identify and measure what what positive impacts we'll be having on the you know on the local communities well it all sounds very encouraging jonathan owen thanks very much for joining us today and talking us through it all thank you alistair good to be here